Hello, welcome back to International Trade Economics 360. Uh, contrary to what I had uh, mentioned at the end of the uh, last uh, uh, video, uh, I decided that instead of uh, adding the few things that I needed to say about both uh, the Stolper Samuelson and the Rybizinski to chapter 10, it would be cleaner if we just spend the 10 minutes or so and clearing this thing up right now in a uh, special uh, presentation and then next week we will deal only with chapter 10 which is uh, a few of the uh, theories that were introduced in an effort to uh, explain some of the flows of trade after uh, uh, the HO model. Uh, Heckscher Olin uh, is a relatively old model and so there have been some attempts at introducing new things but really none of them is as important as Heckscher Olin. However, uh, that's what the, is the subject matter of chapter 10. So anyway, let's go back to this idea. Remember, you, these are not in the book and I want to make sure that you understand them. We spoke about them a little bit in the previous session, but I want, and you have uh, both of these uh, on your uh, 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 blackboard. Uh, I normally, I never really, uh, I find it very difficult to go ahead and listen to something that I have just said or to read an article that I have written, but I forced myself earlier to listen to the previous uh, presentation. I found out, as it is really to be expected, since there is no editing whatsoever and I do all of these things uh, ext extemporaneously, that there were a couple of small uh, mistakes, uh, sort of the typo kind. I hope that uh, you wouldn't mind that. For example, when I referred to the fact that I have these things on uh, Facebook, when obviously what I meant was really Blackboard. I think I corrected myself after I used the Facebook two or three times and then I said Blackboard. So anyway, on Blackboard you do have copies of these two diagrams. And I tried to use exactly the same symbols so that once you look at them, you'll be able to follow the discussion very clearly. You are responsible for all of these and to be able to explain them. The one that we're going to stress more initially because we started if you still recall last time by doing a general uh, algebraic presentation uh, of it even and so I'm gonna go ahead today uh, or, or right now and add certain numerals to that general algebraic presentation so anyway the Stolper Samuelson is one of the single most important implications of trade theory, of the Heckscher Olin. It says that whenever the price of an item is going to increase, and it increases what as a result of trade, then that particular factor of production that is used intensively in that particular good or service is going to gain, and the other is going to lose. So remember, there are always and forever, there are no exceptions to this, none whatsoever. There will always be winners and there will always be losers. And that is one of the reasons why is it that there, are always there is always opposition to international trade. It's only to, it's, it's only to be expected. But the suggestion of Samuelson and all the other economists, obviously, is that then the government can go ahead and take certain steps in order to remedy this, to help those that are going to suffer. So let's do this very quickly. And notice that we're going to use all of these tools that we had developed earlier. You're going to assume that there are two goods, T and S. And the T and the S are represented over here by what? by an isoquant. And an isoquant, what does it represent? It's the various combinations of the two factors, capital and labor, that will produce a certain specific amount of output. In this case, to make things easier for presentation, we're going to assume that each of these isoquants 
the one for the S and the one for the T represents only an output of one dollar. So this is an output of one dollar and this is an output of one dollar. What is the optimum that this society is going to pre produce? Again, as we have discussed earlier, and as you probably know from certain uh, from the economics that you might have taken earlier, it is at the point of intersection with the isocost. Or actually, to, to be precise, at the point of tangency instead of intersection. So you have this, tan this isocost over here. This point of tangency is where the production for T would be. And this point of tangency at F, D, and F will be for the S. So far, so good. There is no trade. It is autarky. Everything is optimized. Now we're going to open trade, and trade is going to be what? N, T. Three, T is going to be exported. Once it's exported, what's going to happen to it? Its price is going to go up. If the price is going to go up, what will happen right now to the isoquant? The isoquant right now must shift downwards, right? Because this is represents only one dollar. Now the price is going to increase from, let's assume, a dime to a quarter. So instead of this representing, let's assume, ten units, Right now, this will have to represent only four units. So whenever the price of T goes up as a result of trade, the iso or other things being equal, the isoquant is going to shift downward. Now, as the isoquant shifts downward, what's happened right now to that optimum combination? I'll have to look for another isocost that is going to be tangent to both. So I find out this isocost curve that's going to be tangent to this and tangent to that. Now notice what's happened. My D has shifted to D prime and my F has shifted to F prime. But what is more important is this. How, what is this, this point over here? This is 1 over R. Right? Because remember, this represented only one dollar. Now what is this? This is going to be one over R prime, which is fine. And again, over here, we have one over W and one over W prime. The point that I think sometimes is a little bit confusing, although it's very, very simple, is that the people do not realize the relationship between R prime and R and between W prime and W. Let us assume, for the sake of the argument, that this is, say, uh, uh, 3. If this is 1 third, right? If R is 3, then 1 over R is 1 over 3. So how much should this be? If this is going to be greater than 3, this should be, for example, 2, right? Which means what? It means that R prime is less than R. R prime is less than R. But what happened to wage is exactly the opposite. If 1 over W is 3, what should the 1 over W prime be? You know, it's smaller than 3. So this must be, let's assume, 4 or 5. So W prime is larger than W. So now what is it that we're saying? We're saying that as a result of the increase in the price of this exported good, the factor that is used intensively, which is labor in T, is going to increase. So wages are going to increase in, the, uh, in, in this case. And then these are the people that are going, uh, are, are going to, sorry, uh, de decrease over here, and these are the people that are going to increase, right? Benefit. Now, if you want to do a numeral, a numerical example, do it like this. Notice. 
P sub W, or in this case, uh, make it sub T, is equal to 2R plus 3W, P sub, uh, what did we call this, S, because initially I had, I had used W and uh, C. Therefore, the P sub W, given, by the way, that you know the R and the W. Remember, the coefficients don't change. So 2 times 10 is 20, 3 times 5 is 15, therefore P sub uh, T is going to be 15. And the P sub uh, S is going to be 4 times 10, 40, plus 5, 45. Now the price of T is going to increase from, uh, where was it, from 35 to 50. Once the price becomes 50, we're going to assume that what's going to happen is that W is going to, to change, right? So it becomes 2 times R, which is 20. 20 plus what? 10 times 3 to make, to make this equal to 50. Therefore, wages are going to become 10. So what happened to wages? They increased from 5 to 10. Right? So the sector that is using labor intensively or a factor intensively is the one that gains. The wages have really doubled in this particular case. Let's find out what will happen really to the other sector, to the other factor of production. Notice, you assume that this price over here is not going to change. So if this price is not going to change, you will find out ultimately that it is going to become uh, 8.75. So this increases, the other, uh, the other one decreases. Therefore, there's always a winner and there's always a loser. In the case of the Robizinski, which is known as the Dutch disease, all what we're saying, as we said earlier, that if a particular factor is going to increase, then the increase in that particular factor is going to benefit one sector at the expense of the other. So how can we prove this? These are proofs of the theory. The proof over here is that this is the capital labor ratio of one, this is the capital labor ratio of the other. So one of them is more capital intensive than the other. And again, one more time, we use, uh, let's assume S and we use T. So this is an isoquant of one and this is an isoquant of one. Therefore, what is the optimum? The optimum is going to be this isocost whereby both of them are tangent at that particular point. Now, we want to show what will be the effect of an increase in one of the values? So let me assume that labor initially is here. If labor is here, how is this going to be allocated amongst the two of them? It's going to be allocated in such a way as to produce H and in order to produce H and G. If labor is to increase to E', to e prime, all of a sudden there's an increase in labor, or if you want to use the example that we used earlier, an increase in oil, and the idea, by the way, is called the Dutch disease, because the economist wrote an article about what happened, the experience of Holland, when they discovered natural gas in the North Sea. Everybody thought that the Holland was going to just boom all over. What happened is that one sector boomed, but the rest of the economy didn't. Deindustrialization of the United States, what happened? One sector boom, the other didn't. Canada, what's happening in Canada right now for all practical purposes? The tar sand is creating a boom, but the other sectors haven't, ha have suffered. So in this case, we increase this factor, all other things being equal. Notice what's going to happen. We're going to increase the production here from, we're going to move from H to H prime. That's to say it's going to increase while G is going to drop from G to G sub 1. So one more time, what is the Rubizinski? The Rubizinski is that whenever 
there is a factor, that factor will benefit the production of the item in which it is going to be the major one, and the other will have to suffer. So with that, I think we should be ready to speak about the additional theories uh, next week, uh, which is chapter 10. And we'll speak about three or four or five other theories. Uh, we will use maybe just a few graphs, but in general, they're really essentially descriptive. Okay? And they are not, uh, not, not technical at all. So with that, I'll leave you until next week.